my 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 uh, intention for this talk is to like uh, is to make some very general and basic points about vital normativity. So well, what I'm talking about is norms which apply to living beings, um, and um, yeah, or maybe at least raise some open questions about this topic. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to do this primarily by drawing on uh, the work of Georges Canguillem, uh, but also um, also on drawing on some more recent inactivist uh, literature. Um, and I'm going to assume that I, I, I hope you are a little bit familiar with inactivism. I know we have like tomorrow we have, we have some, um, presentation is on that topic, but I won't really go into detail. So excuse me if there's some like um, so some things that are maybe poorly uh, introduced. Um, but yeah, okay. So so my 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 my, my intention is to like just draw some interesting uh, parallels and divergences between the two approaches. So Kangiam and, and and activism, and um, by this way I want to show like of course yeah. So Kangiam is a little bit more historically distant to our present time than and activism, and in that sense I would I would, I would like to show. Um, what kind of value we can still uh, draw from, from, from his work, um, and that there, there are some surprising convergences with uh, the present and activist literature. Um, from what I know, there haven't really been uh, any, any contact, although, although they could be, because there was like overlap in the work of, I mean, uh, lives of Kangiam and Varela. But anyway, yeah, there are, so, there are also some interesting divergences, and in which uh, I think, like, at least uh, f that may be interesting for the present time, at least if one is uh, somewhat sympathetic towards the inactivist approach or similar uh, types of uh, understandings of, of, of vital normativity. I think that one can draw a lot of uh, interesting inspiration um, from the work of Kangiam and maybe. <clears throat> One also finds some interesting challenges for, for let's say, further uh, contemporary discussions. Um, so my talk is going to be focused on two, let's say, general issues. Um, <clears throat> the first being, like, let's say, is uh, the question: um, Why ascribe norm to norms to living beings at all? Or, to put it more specifically, like, which features of living beings? Um, give grounds for, uh, for 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 thinking of them in terms of like uh, being subject to norms or more specific, more uh, like actually said being um, normative agents. And I'm going to go, come back to this concept sort of because I think that what, an important aspect of this issue is is to is to is to try to get really clear what one what actually means by the notion of norm and uh, normative normative agents. So that's going to be also a part of my discussion and then the second major topic is is the question concerning like uh, uh, recent naturalistic debate or ongoing debates ab about uh, the status of normativity uh, in the context of naturalism um, so what I mean by that specifically is like the status of norms in the context of um, the current let's say white held frameworks from for explaining natural phenomena so if you concede the question arises if you concede, on the one hand, that living beings indeed are some sort of normative agents, and on the other hand, you are um, you are ready to admit that living beings do share some important characteristics with other natural phenomena, the world of non-living uh, phenomena. Then, as as both of these uh, approaches do claim, so or, uh, both Kandiam and, and, and activists do claim that the, there is some overlap, which is important to take into account. And if you if you start from this sta uh, starting point, then yeah, the question arises: how how do you how do you um, account for normative phenomena within the framework of natural sciences. Can there be a natural science of norms, of normativity? Or maybe more modestly, what would be some steps to take towards such a, such a, um, um, achieving such a position? And um, to foreshadow, yeah, so we're, we're going to see yeah, that Kangian is explicitly cr critical about this very possibility of, of, of some sort of natural science of norms, whereas I think uh, I would claim that inactivism does, I think, make some promising steps in this direction. So by, by actually um, 
addressing Kung Yem's uh, misgivings about the possibility of such a science. And then on the other hand, I'm also going to, uh, this is going to be at the end of my, my talk, I'm going to show some, um, let's say, subtleties of Kung Yem's understanding of vital norms, with, uh, which I think are very noteworthy and also I, I think a little bit more problematic in, in this regard. Um, so yeah, let's just uh, dry, <coughs> jump straight in now. What, what, would, what we mean by, by vital normativity, I think that the best way to approach this is to um, start the way Kang Yem sometimes starts uh, in some of his texts, like, but basically by, by asking first, what, well, what do we mean by norms in general? And um, I think he, his understanding of this is pretty much in line with what, um, what are like a, a contemporary understanding of this would be. So basically, a norm is a standard or an ideal with respect to which something can be evaluated as either correct, incorrect, adequate, inadequate, or ultimately good or bad in that sense or the other. Uh, <clears throat> and I think it's interesting to point out that Kung Yem here uh, makes a reference to like the Latin etymology of, of, of this term, which uh, originally uh, referred to a carpenter's, carpenter's square. So that would be a, like this thing depicted on the right. At least that would be a more <coughs> easily recognizable modern version of a carpenter's square. And, and you see like, yeah, so it, this is used in construction primarily in order to, to measure or to determine the right angle or something and to try and to adjust what you're building accordingly. So you can, you can sort of see what, what, um, how, how this would be uh, relevant, right? So this would, be, this would be a perfect example of a kind of a norm. So like say a carpenter square is a norm, something in relation to which you can define something as being adequate or inadequate, something which you then regulate. Um, but <clears throat> of course, uh, the second thing that Kung Yem points out is that we are prone to forget that of course it isn't the, the actual object that's, that's, that's the actual norm. It's not the material thing that you take as a, as a standard. It's the role of this thing, is the role that this thing plays in the act of estimating something with respect to something else. So the ideal isn't really a, some specific object. It's never like some specific state of the affairs, but it's always, it always presupposes some act of comparison. Um, and in this sense, like, yeah, so, so what is, is really important to, to take away from this is that if, when you're talking about norms, you're really presupposing some act of norm, norming or normativity, some normative agent who is doing the estimating. Uh, and this is like uh, important for, for the, as an introduction to vital norms because precisely this is what Kung Yang is interested in, not, not, not in norms in a, in a wider sense where you could say like living beings are subject to norms which would be external to them, like, like say um, machines would be subject to norms of a mechanic, like so the mechanics ju judges whether a machine is working properly or not, what, what is the function of, of this or that. But when, when we're talking about living being, beings, we're really interested in their, uh, in their uh, capacity of being a normative agent, so constituting their own norms of their own activity of estimating something, of evaluating their environment. <clears throat> um, yeah, so that's pretty much, yeah, that's, that's, that's pretty much how we, we, we could uh, define <clears throat> vital normativity in the most abstract sense would be like, like um, a system that somehow establishes its own point, normative point of view. Um, and, <clears throat> or maybe, yeah, maybe it's a little more, more specific. So, um, Vital norms in the most, like, like uh, say, um, um, most specific sense for, for Kung Yem are normative agents which are also subject to their own norms. So you could say, like, living beings regulate, like, themselves according to their own norms of what is good for them or what is their conditions of survival of, or well-being. So, the question is, where, where do we see, like, how would we recognize such normative um, features in the living organisms? And, and Kang Yam's answer is yes, of course, we do recognize it, um, specifically in, in, in the processes such as self-construction, self in the sense of there's, there being a, some sort of metabolism uh, which cont continually uh, replenishes, let's say, uh, um, matter and energy lost to the environment, 
And, and on the other hand, you have self-regulation, some like the most obvious example of this would be homeostasis, so living beings some, somehow regulate their own uh, internal states and, and, and contract perturbation so as, to, so as to maintain some sort of <coughs> steady range of, of uh, conditions uh, necessary for their survival. Um, <coughs> and um, in both of these cases, you see that, yeah, we, we, you, you somehow, I mean, at least according to Kangian, there's, an, there's obviously some sort of normativity here at play. So, the, so living beings, at least implicitly, you, 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 you see that, I mean, we could recognize that they some, somehow, at least implicitly, um, define some sort of preferred state or preferred behavior, some sort of preference, and that they actively take steps toward achieving this, this preference. Um, <clears throat> Um, so in that sense, yeah, he says, like, life is, in general, could be uh, considered as being like an, a dynamic polarity. So polarity in, in the sense of there always being some sort of differentiation between good and bad states and, and, and dynamic in the sense of always trying to regulate, the, uh, move towards the, um, um, towards some preferred state. Um, <clears throat> am I forgetting something? Well, okay, so yeah, that, that would be, hmm, disregard this question, that should be an arrow. Um, <clears throat> uh, so maybe just a quick um, jump, jump toward to an activism, and uh, like very briefly I would like to some, make some parallels. Those who are, of you who maybe are familiar with this school of thought have already probably discerned the, the parallels, some obvious parallels, right? So. Um, so the first thing to note, right, is that um, the very basic features of life, according to an activist such as Varela and Maturana, is precisely this uh, process of self-production and self-regulation. Like both of these things actually fit nicely within this concept of autopoiesis. So the system which builds itself, like uh, um, <clears throat> continuously, actively maintains its own specific structure. Um, and it is, it is on this basis that also Varela um, and uh, yeah, Varela and, and also most of, uh, many of his um, so not, not, not followers but his circle um, <clears throat> um, argued that the normative agents we, we, we can consider living beings to be normative agents precisely insofar as they exhibit autopoietic organization. So it's because we see living beings as actively constituting their own. Um, their own structure, but also like gravitating toward like the conditions of their survival that we can say that they are uh, in some sense normative agents. Um, and also, yes, it also, um, it's precisely because this, like this, this may be, I could relate very quickly to what we were saying about boundaries, like you could say, like you could, you could have bona fide and, 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 and um, um, fiat boundaries, and you could say also like this, in the sense that there, there's a, this great problematic in biology, uh, I guess, uh, I mean, as far as I know, to what extent you are um, projecting your own norms or your own, let's say, um, um, their own ideas about what norms, what uh, what 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 norms would would uh, this, uh, what kind of norms would uh, linguists exhibit, and to what extent you can actually say that the norm is ontologically a feature of that living organism. You know what I mean. So, in on the one hand, there's always this issue whether is the norm we are attributing to a living being actually the norm of that living being, or is it just our projection from our own, let's say, teleological standpoint or something? And in the sense, yes, the, the argument is precisely because the living being constitutes itself, actively maintains itself, that we can say that it's an ontological feature of that organism. It's something that the organism needs in order to, act, to, to even stay alive or, or, or um, counteract um, <clears throat> dissipation. <clears throat> so, okay, um, maybe, how much time do I have? Still, I don't know if time, I think, 20 minutes. 20 minutes, okay. <clears throat> so, yeah, let's, uh, 
consider now um, um, some Kangyam's arguments against uh, naturalism. So, so uh, as I said, Kangyam is explicitly um, critical of this idea that there could be uh, any 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 natural science, at least as as um, natural science as we are used to it, as we know it, of of normativity. There are some major issues he sees with um, with how one would fit the notion of normativity into the conceptual framework of, of the natural sciences. <coughs> and, and I'm going to give like two two um, two basic arguments. That I'm going to yeah present two basic arguments that Kangyan gives um, in support of this. So the first one would be um, the the idea that norms cannot be reducible to physical or chemical laws. So it, they cannot they cannot be reducible to any sort of deterministic regularity. So when we're talking about physical laws, we usually presuppose that we have uh, some sort of, of, of rule that cannot be broken, that if something, uh, if, if, if a phenomenon is in a given starting condition, then, then it will always take the same route. It will always unfold in, uh, temporarily, like, unfold um, in the same way. Um, so if we know the starting condition of some physical system, then we can um, deterministically uh, um, explain like how it's going to unfold over time, right? So, and <clears throat> for Kangyan, uh, he points out just like, like a very simple argument that norms are rules which can be broken. So, of course, like an organism who prefers to stay alive won't necessarily actually stay alive, right? It, it can fail, uh, and if there are any explanatory is if there is an explanatory value to to norms as such they would constitute more of a tendency in the sense that you could say if an organism has this and these preferences then it will tend toward that state it will, it will, it will most likely achieve this state if it doesn't uh, encounter any 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 um, any 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 problems with its environment um but yeah so it it most definitely won't won't um necessarily achieve some preferred state <clears throat> um and then <clears throat> there's this other argument um that uh, that has to do with the problem with, with the relationship between holes and parts so um, basically what kungian is saying that um mechanicism like let's say yeah okay. Um, at least according to him, is necessarily uh, a, a kind of a part text apart explanation. So basically, if you were to um, account for all the parts, the relevant parts of a given system, and if you had um, knowledge of all the relevant local interactions between those parts, then you would explain the entire system, or you could give a, an adequate um, you could you could describe the entire dynamics of the entire system by describing the dynamics of their its locally interacting parts. Okay, so <clears throat> and there's this problem with uh, w there's a problem with this according to Kungian because <clears throat> there's obviously we see that the same sort of local interactions could have different normative values for different organisms or even the same organism in a slightly different state. Uh, he, he's, he has a, like a colorful way of saying this, that on the level of local interactions, you couldn't really distinguish between food and excrement. So, <laughs> which, which is to say that if you have one organism which considers some, some substance food, and another uh, uh, organism that excretes this substance, on the level of local interaction between this substance and every, any of the two given organisms, basically the same laws hold. And you could s observe this pretty much. Say, the same uh, local interaction, or even maybe um, a more, even more uh, a telling example, or maybe more clear, is this. I've taken this picture from X school, um, so yeah. But but it's nice. It nicely illustrates this point. So here we have um, a hermit crab, and this this was a study of how hermit crab interacts with 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 a, what was this um, sea anemone, and <clears throat> the point is that. Mm, 
the Homo crab is going to use or interact with this object in a very different way, depending on how, uh, what's, what, what is the, what's the, what's like, like a, a general holistic state of this crab. Um, so whether the crab is missing uh, his, uh, his, his house, um, he's going to try to use this as, as a form of protection. But where, if the crab is hungry, then he's going to try to eat it and, and so forth. And, and you see that, that the local interaction between the sensor, like the sensory um, part of the crab and, and the object are, are basically the same. And, and, uh, and even so, we observe that the, the, the um, holistic uh, behavior of the crab is totally different in each case. Each case. So, <clears throat> okay, so that would be the next. Uh, what the, the, was the first interaction? Um, I think... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's not what you think. I, I, I've checked, and I really wanted this to be the case, but it's not. <laughs> so, well, what is it? It is um, actually okay. I always I I, I um I over oversimplified because the crabs use this as a form of protection. With the, if they have a, a shell, then they use this as a form of protection against squid, I think. And if they don't have a shell, then they use this just in the in in the, in the place of the shell. So what he's doing here, he's just trying to attach this. On top of his, so so that the squid don't see him or something. Uh, uh, isn't it that, that the, in the third example he already has a shell and puts it on, and then the, the second one he doesn't have a shell, put, but the first one he eats it. No. So it uses it as a food. So three possible modes, but it's not important that the same method yeah, applies. I, I, I think that the first one is food, the second one is uh, putting on instead of the shell, and then putting it on the shell. As a, Maybe. As Maybe. I, I checked it yesterday, so I, well, I don't It, it doesn't matter. <laughs> <Okay>. <clears throat> Three different. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so now I'm moving back towards, uh, back to, back to inactivism. Um, again, I have some issues with my arrows, sorry. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to try to, to at least briefly try to, um, Try to try to explain how how an activism addresses these issues and how it would maybe how it could be seen as a, how the inactivist uh, approach could be seen as a sort of um, as a sort of middle middle ground um, between let's say like this kind of reductionist mechanicism and 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 uh, Kangiem's position or. Can, Varela explicitly says in some article, which I found uh, very, very telling in this context, that his position is a sort of middle ground between vitalism and reductionism, precisely in the sense that yes, okay, so we oh, so this would be um, relevant for the first problem, uh, for the second problem of, of the relationship between holes and parts. So I'm, go I'm going to split this argument in, in two ways, the same as I split the, the two problems. So the first one would be tendencies against uh, versus laws and the second would be parts versus holes okay so we're here right now we're talking just about parts and holes because this is some in some sense the more fundamental problem of the two as we'll <coughs> see in, in, uh, yeah so um to continue <coughs> um this 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 could be read in this in this in in the sense that uh we don't need any any extra ontological element such as uh, a vitalism, a vitalist might, 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 might postulate. We don't, what, what is this hole that Kang Yem is, is, um, is, is trying to um, um, convince us of? Uh, it's not some extra ingredient. It's not something that you have some, some sort of extra force or, or element or material. It's, um, Varela is quite clear um, that he considers autopoietic holes to be nothing other than a specific um, specific um, networks of um, locally interacting parts. But then what is the, this, this element that is, um, what is this hole? Well, this hole is precisely the network. Like, the, the, let me say the hole is the, the form of the or the organization of this network, and this is important because if we, without knowing this this form, this uh, specific um, 
topology of, of, of the kinds of interactions that you see in a given system, the kinds of local interactions that you see, you won't really uh, account for the, the, the actual dynamics of these systems. Um, <clears throat> I, 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 um, this is a picture from um, Paolo? the Paolo and Thompson's article. Yes, I took it from there. It's, it depicts actually, an, it's, it's, a, it's a diagram of an autonomous system, but it, this, it doesn't really matter. In this context, uh, it, it could all, 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 I mean, you could say that this is also a diagram of an autopoietic system. And I think it's nice. It serves an, as a nice explication of what I mean here. So maybe yes, yeah, so you could um, you could you, you have to pay attention to my cursor now. Um, <clears throat> uh, so you you see that we have some some black dots from black, black nodes which stand for the organism, and we have some 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 um, um, <clears throat> gray nodes which stand for the outside environment, <clears throat> and the arrows stand for specific local interactions. Um, so you could say that an arrow, the direction of the arrow says something like, uh, this, this particular node here in some ways constrains or modifies the activity of this node over here and so, and so on. Um, <clears throat> and um, the, what, what is actually autopoietic organization? Well, first of all, for those who maybe haven't heard of the definition, autopoietic um, uh, organization is the kind of organization of, uh, of the network of interactions of given parts of the system that allows for continual um, maintenance of this very um, network, of the very topology of this network, in a sense. So <clears throat> you could see this, I mean, this is uh, like not clear from this picture itself, but you can see that all the, uh, yeah, this, this, there's, what distinguishes this system from the environment is the particular uh, is, is the nature of the arrows involved. So, <clears throat> um, for what the Paolo and, 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 and Thompson say that yeah, so any of these black dots would eventually disappear if you were to if you were to ch permutate the arrows far enough from from their given from the current um, topology. <laughs> And in this sense, this is a self-sustaining system, whereas the environment is not, uh, in this sense, dependent upon the entire network. Um, <clears throat> so, so what is like this new feature of this network is 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 precisely um, um, this this self self uh, self um, maintaining uh, characteristic characteristic of this um, specific whole, right? So, so these two nodes do not have an autopoietic organizations, they, they, they won't actively maintain their, their specific um, structure, whereas this, this part will. So this, is, this could be, you could say that there are some properties which emerge at the level of, of, of holes of specifically organized um, complex systems. <coughs> and also, just to relate this maybe a bit um, more to, to the um, to Kangiams, or actually to yeah, to, to, to exclude this example, um, imagine that this is now a crab. So, so, so this, 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 this structure here is the, the crab that we've been looking at. And let's say that this is the, this is the, the, the sea anemone, right? So um, what you see is that, of course, this node, part, this particular node over, over here is not determined or constrained only, only, only by this, 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 um, Entity over here, but also the the it it also receives local interactions, local influences from from at least two nodes over here, and then of of course over the course of time, it will in some sense or the other be determined by the whole network. So this in uh, like um, uh, ultimately just because it would the whole network would would, dis, would disintegrate if if you hadn't if it weren't part of this specific uh, system. So you could say, of course, now we understand why, why the, 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 the total behavior is going to be different, right? So if, if you have these states in some different values, then the, the, the behavior of the entire system is going to be different from this. Um, um, from, let's say, if you were to isolate this, this, these two nodes like, like such, then you, of course, again, you would have a totally different dynamic um, 
And, and this is not to say that they're, they're, the laws are not the same. You, you say that all of these arrows express the same basic uh, physical chemical laws, right? Because the laws actually do not tell you you, you cannot deduce the dynamic of any given system just from the laws it's themselves. You have to know um, some sort of initial conditions, at least. You have to, to define what kind of a system, what variables are at play here, um, what, what parts you're looking at, what structures, and so forth. So, <clears throat> um, so yeah, that would be the basic point. So even if you were to, I mean, these are locally interacting parts with the same sort of um, basic, basic laws, but then you, you have at the, at the higher level, you would have some emerging um, <clears throat> behavior or something that wouldn't be really deducible from uh, local interactions, at least taken in isolation. Um, and then, yes, this, I'm going to now, this would be, um, relating to the, the, the first issue, so the issue of, of tendency. And I'm sorry if I bore any, any <laughs> natural science trained person here because this is going to be very rudimentary and maybe interesting, exciting only for philosophers such as myself who are mind blown by the very, like, <laughs> very simple things. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, that's, that's this is, I think, a more like, uh, and also, yeah, whereas the, the, the other, I, I, I think I would endorse um, the inactivist position as far as um, what I've been talking before uh, goes, but here I'm a little bit more um, undecided whether this really, um, whether this is, whether this is re really an adequate uh, whether this really overcomes what Kung Yam's issue is with uh, mechanicism. So the notion of a tractor, <clears throat> so how do we, how do we overcome this uh, dichotomy between laws and tendencies? Um, without actually uh, getting rid, rid of the laws, we still yeah, operate within a deterministic universe where, so where, where some basic, let's say, physical chemical laws hold. But then, um, um, dynamic systems theory, uh, I think, offers like an interesting way to get around that, it, a way to like specify what you actually mean by tendency, even though you're starting from a deterministic um, <clears throat> um, um, uh, picture of the world. And uh, the idea is this. So, uh, oh, and of course, yeah, inactivism in this sense is, is one of the, uh, let's say, proponents of, of, the, of the wider field of dynamic systems theory. Um, <clears throat> so, what is the idea? Um, in order to define an attractor, you have to define a space phase, uh, phase space of, of a given system. And uh, that would be like um, a space in s representing all the possible variables relevant or of a given system, or, or at least relevant uh, to, an, to, to, to um, describing a given system. And so you see in here, we can plot this phase space in a graph. This, this, this would be, this would all be very, the most rudimentary kind of phase spaces you could have. Uh, so two dimensional, and this means that we are, we are interested in two, two different, uh, so just two variables. And uh, just to like, clarify, if you wanted to make a phase space of this like system here, then you would need a, at least as many dimensions as, as you have nodes, right? At least as many, but there could be more. Um, <clears throat> and, and for each node, you would specify like a variable, and the variable would tell you what specific state uh, that node is at any given time, right? Um, <clears throat> And so once you have that like plotted on a graph like this, then any point on this graph will stand for the state of that system as a whole, the, the specific uh, unique state of that system at any given point in time, right? So if you have a point here, this would say like X is something and, 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 and Y is something, or some specific value. And as you move along this graph, you are basically, the line you, you draw on this graph stands for the temporal trajectory of this given system. So how any given variable changes 
in the in the course of time. Okay, so if you have such a such a representation now dynamic representation, then you can start to um, make some like s s extract some patterns. Like for for example, if you were to observe this system under different conditions, like let's say you put it in in this. Let's say you have an organism, and, 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 you, and, and this would be a graph of all its possible perturbations, say. And if you were to perturb it in this way, or in this way, or in this way, and if you were to see that all these perturbations eventually gravitate towards some sort of uh, fixed point, or it doesn't really have to be a fixed point, actually, but that would, it's not really so relevant. If, if, if you see some sort of convergence of these lines towards some um, more um, bounded area, then you could say that this would be some sort of a preferred state of the organism. Um, so you actually define some tendency, right, uh, as opposed to, to a law. So here you can see that even though any specific jump from one point of another, you could say that it's governed by deterministic laws. But in, in, in some sense, like the, the, the system as a whole exhibits some tendency, right? And maybe just to clarify here, again, if you're just operating on this very, very schematic, simple system with one attractor, then you can, it, it can't even really call it a tendency. It's still a, basically a rule. You will always find your way back here. But of course, you, you can have more complex systems with many attractors where you could actually say that uh, let's, let's, let's consider this system with two attractors, let, and let's say that maybe this point here stands for like the state of the system, like a preferred state of some living organism. And this point here would correspond to death, basically. So disintegration of, of, the, of the organism. And you can say like, yeah, you, you, you see some clear tendencies where you see that if you start here and you start here and start here, the, the organism under those perturbations would eventually find itself right back to its preferred state. But if you were to start here, then you will get so if you were to push this organism far enough over there it's it's uh, what it, what it, what it can handle then then it will disintegrate so in this sense you can say what I, what i'm really trying to to get across is that <clears throat> you um you can actually define a tendency in this sense like it's, you, you can see some some sort of um um, you see, you can see some, something gravitating towards some point. You can actually, you could say that it's, it strives towards. It acts. In, you could define it as, as actively striving towards some point. But of also, you can break this rule. You can, you have, you can specify conditions under which this rule is broken. <coughs> rule in quote marks, I guess. Uh, this norm is broken. Mm. Okay. Um, how am I doing now? Five minutes? Yeah. Okay. Ma maximum? Oh, yeah. So then I'm going to very quickly. So yeah, that that was that was the uh, uh, um, the section where I try to show how an activism makes some, let's say, on my uh, on my view, some promising uh, steps toward, like, let's say, some uh, um, adequate natural sciences of norms but here now i'm and this is the last part i'm going to going to um make some 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 um i'm going to point out some subtleties in congam's understanding of norms which i think uh pose some further challenges and spe specifically i want to highlight this notion of creative normativity um by congam um which is um yeah this is something that i haven't really been um, mentioning so far. So, so far we've been talking about norms which Kangian uh, would term conservative norms in the sense that these would be norms um, where you would start by some fixed ideal of what your preferred state is and, and all the, everything to do next would be just to sort of try to, to get closer to this, to this state. Um, but as Kangian points out, that this not, isn't um, isn't the only way that living beings can can address problems uh, in this sense. So, uh, one way to address problems is yes, this is the, this, the act of regulation is to just keep the ideal, the norm fixed, and try to bring the reality, so to say, closer to the ideal. But then the other way of of, of dealing with with issues um, would be to 
establish a new norm with, with to, to, to change this set point, right? So this ideal uh, which you're trying to approximate and, and, and try to establish new, new, um, new criteria which may be, may, which may be better suited to some environmental challenges. And I think this is best, uh, um, uh, this would be more, most clear if I, if I give some examples. So, so that would be like, there are very, very different examples that, that Kungian gives. So one would be like an athlete, or let's say, um, I, I think a good example is like a mountaineer who has to get acclima uh, um, acclimatized to a high altitude. And in this sense, Kangyan would say that it's his uh, homeostatic set points are, are in, in some sense adjusted. So it has adjusted to, to lower uh, oxygen blood levels by, by producing more hemoglobin or something. Uh, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter if this is even like a, not a, a good example. But you see the Kangem's point, right? So this could be um, <clears throat> understand, understood maybe as a kind of um, his, his version of, of, of the, the notion of, of heterostasis, right? Um, but then there's also, um, I mean, heterostasis as we understand it now. But I want to point out sort of some examples which are not really so well understood even at the present day as well as notions such as heterostasis, which would be, yeah, much, much more difficult processes to pin down like his uh, one of the examples he gives is a, like a development from childhood to adulthood where you could say that you have a living being with a metabolism that tries to self con construct but of course the metabolism of the child is trying to construct maintain a, a very different organizations than the metabolism of an adult there's completely different rights um, uh, um, uh, structures at play there, uh, and then of, then another like again very different um, kind of example would be social norms of or let's say let's stick to just this uh, um, example that Kangyam says that yeah it, specific to humans maybe or or at least um, as far as you know would be this. Uh, capacity to contemplate ends, to try to like, contemplate the meaning of one's life. So if one actually has the capacity to, to, to ask oneself, what is the meaning of my life? What, what is the purpose? Uh, and, and actually no, no, not only contemplate, but actually like s define some sort of purpose to one's life, then of course we can say that uh, human beings at least do not operate on some sort of fixed vital norms. They're, they're, if, if we are talking on, of vital norms on the order uh, of, of human behavior, then, then these kinds of norms cannot really be set in stone, right? So you have to s give some sort of account of how, how the very set point, the very ideal changes over time. Uh, <clears throat> and this would, be, this would bring me to my last, uh, my, my conclusion. Like, I think that this is um, points in a very interesting direction. And um, it's especially interesting to think about this in terms of autopoiesis for me, um, because there seems to be some problem here, right? So if you start from the notion of autopoiesis, then can you really, um, can you can you define this sort of moving um, moving set point? I don't. I'm really not sure. So that would be like an open question for me. Um, but I think that there are two kinds of ways of understanding autopoiesis. One would be that this is the this process of conservation of norm. So that would be like maybe a mo the, the most direct reading of a classical um, definition, where like it's a an autopoietic system is a system who which um, conserves the very, very um, organization, which but basically which c conserves its organization. And you can understand this organization by in the sense of the, the form, the topological form of local interactions of its parts. But then if you define it this way, then this such a system cannot really ever get beyond itself in that sense. It re it, if it has some set point, some, some ideal state towards it gravitates, it will never, never actually transcend that, um, that ideal, that, that, um, um, that specific tendency. Um, but another way of defining uh, autopoiesis would be that it's the 
autopoetic character of a system that remains the same, not the actual form. So you could have different sort of topological um, varieties of, 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 of organizations that you could attribute, it, attribute to different, let's say, uh, points uh, of the development of some organism. But what remains the same is the autopoetic character at each point. So at each point of some, let's say, um, developmental progression, there still has to be um, the, 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 the living being has to some, some, somehow um, retain um, some basic features of its organization, although, all, although what it's trying to maintain may change over time. So that, that, would, be, that would be my conclusion and an open question. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> well, we have time for maybe just one question, and not particularly long one. <coughs> I have a long one, so... <laughs> maybe you shorten it, and then... Uh, uh, yeah, shorten it, and then find a way to include it into the discussion. I can try, but did anybody else... Uh, Any short, short questions? Question. Okay, 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 I have a short one. Oh, I can try. If you no, go ahead. So, so thanks for, first of all, um, a lot of thinking and work is going into this, I think. I had the impression at least, and I'm not sure if you mentioned it, but maybe you can repeat it or, or emphasize on where norms are coming from in the first place. So the origins of a norm, where it's coming from, and if you thought about values as well, because you haven't mentioned values, and if this is of any importance for your thinking about. I'm not sure if I understand w in what sense do you mean the origin of norms? Do you mean the origin of the concept or the... Well, I think midway through you talked about this um, regulation and evaluation of norms, that this is kind of a self, self-driven self process for human beings, Yeah, if that's right. So and then well, I was just wondering where this is coming from, if, you, if this is a part of your work as well the origins of the norm, if it is already there, always, or if it's just coming of evolution, or oh, what is the first norm? Oh, okay, yes, I, I, now I see what you mean. So okay. in the sense that, yes, some, then autopoetic organization would constitute, let's say, a norm, but you cannot really explain how a norm emerges from something that's non-normative, or what you, what you want to say. Well, I mean, there is also highly prominent uh, the halting problem, maybe, and there is sometimes also called the starting problem, where, where, you, where you're starting off with, with some kind of theory, or where is the boundary beginning, or, or even with norms, you could say. That's just a question. Maybe it's not the part of your interest, and then we can skip I it. I mean, I think it's, it has to do with, like, autopoiesis, right? I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure, because you kind of s maybe didn't explain autopoiesis in this way, but I think you mentioned that the norm is constituted by the process, or for Varela at least. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, the question of where it's coming from is like, um, maybe it's a little, um, you could answer, I mean, it's, um, it might have different meanings. So in the one sense, you would say that it comes from the structure or better said, organization of that giving system. So you would say that the norm isn't act, isn't embodied by any specific node, but by the temporal dynamics of this in globally, let's say, um, global si system of interacting parts, right? Which which interact in such a way so as to uh, regulate this, this 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 system as a whole. Um, but then, if your question is who has set up like the organism such that it can constitute a norm, that's a whole different question, which I don't have a good answer to. I think this question is basically like a question of origins of life, right? If you suppose that life is inherently normative, then the question of how, how would you constitute norms out of something, some phenomenon that isn't a normative agent is, is basically a question how you get from non-life to life. But I'm not really sure. No, I, first of all, I'm not sure if I addressed your question mm -hmm. or not. <laughs> I think that's the question, right? I mean, how, how, they, how the norms do emerge, let's say? <laughs> we can say so, yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, also refer to, to the distinguishing of 
of natural laws and physical laws and chemical laws. And I think you said that, that norms are not part of that, are not reducible to physical or chemical laws. And so I'm quite sympathetic with thinking about norms as something that are coming more to us than, than we are creating norms or values. That's more the term that I'm using in this kind of framework. So values are more or less having us, where you have these emergent processes. And then it's not so clear saying that norms are not reducible or not in any sense similar to physical laws or chemical laws. That was just a kind of the threat of, of thinking where I was leading to and just wanted to know what your thoughts about the origins of a norm, if that's man-made, so to speak, or socio uh, sociological consequence or not, or yeah, 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 that's if it's point. not physical or chemical. Yes, I see, okay, a, yes. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, there's a whole this question of like human norms would be. I mean, it's a huge question anyway. But what? Well, yeah, um, well, yeah. So, so, I, but I, I do have some uh, answers. I mean, um, I think that it's important to yeah. Uh, so, if you're talking about vital norms, I think that's one should distinguish somehow within like let's say social norms of the type of like let's say linguistic norms. I don't know. I, I really can't speak to that at the present moment at least. But then if we, if we say like, okay, human beings share with all living beings the vital norms which constitute their like um, preferred state of their, let's say, bodily um, well-being or something like, so define some sort of like conditions of their survival. And then you could say, um, well, who constitutes this norm? It's not us in the sense of me deciding that I will I will formulate this as a kind of proposition. So my conditions of survival are this and this, my values are this and that. No, I, I just, I, I embody those values, I don't decide. They, 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 they constitute me, not the other way around, okay? But there's another level um, to consider here, which I tried to, to, to get at with this notion of creative normativity, which is you really can have both in some sense. You, you can say that you are constituted by some value, but there's, a, there's like a feedback loop which, which goes through your, like, let's say, your, your activities, uh, which may reshape your, uh, your predisposition, your, 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 let's say, your, your, your ideals, but not in the sense that you can decide momentarily. You have to, some, some, somehow you have to um, affect your, like, global state in some sense. You have to, you have to change the, the, the type of structure you embody. And this, I think, wouldn't go like, you can't really decide on that. Because, but also, why not? I mean, I don't really have a good answer on why not, why, let's, let's keep it at that. <coughs> okay, we have a short break now, approximately 10 minutes, and then one more lecture, and then discussion, and done for today. <laughs>